This is um, what I believe, which I knew Charlie believed this, Charlie Hagee. You can go through all of his videos and he says the same thing. And this was before he, this would have been before he died. This was on his channel. Like I said, nothing's been posted on that channel. He called himself called Servant 29. Nothing's been on that channel since uh, his death. And this was on Sunday, April 22nd, 2012. Now, not only does Charlie Hagee believe this, but I believe this, and I believe Howard Pittman in his book explains what happens to him very well. I don't say that he says it like me and Charlie says it, but I do say that Howard Pittman puts it in a way to where it's not like you could just get your license and go and sin. And he proves that in what happened to him in his own near-death experience. And here's from Charlie Hagee's, um, from his YouTube page, and then you go over to the to about and it, and it gives all these different blog spots where he wrote blogs reproving the OSAS heresy a Sunday April 22nd 2012 reproving the once saved always saved teaching the arguments and defenses for this doctrine are fi 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 philosophical not biblical those who hold this doctrine assume that those who reject this teaching hold to a salvation by works doctrine. This is not always true. Actually, the scripture disproves both of these teachings. It is not an oxymoron to believe we're saved by grace through faith and not a salvation by works doctrine while rejecting the once saved, always saved doctrine. Now, this was an article, obviously, that Charlie pulled up. But down in the comments, when I get down to that, he left his comments on this. And I will read that with this. The scripture simply doesn't teach we're saved by works, nor does it teach the OSAS doctrine. This is what it does say concerning the relationship between works and faith. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? James 2, 14. Even so, faith, if, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Verses 16 and 17. But wilt thou, o, o vain man, that faith without works is dead? Verse 20. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. Verse 22. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Verse 24. For this, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Verse 26. Now, I'm just going to put in a missy note here. I pray to God, all you people who are once saved, always saved, and you love to harass me, and you love to read through and hack into my stuff and make your judgments. Why don't you just do this? Why don't you just stay away from me? Stay out of my life. Stay out of my private life. Stop reading my, my text to my son, my daughter, to my brother, to John. Stay out of my life. Stop following and watching what I watch. It's none of your business. I'm asking you in the name of Jesus to leave me alone. It's amazing to me how many, how so many teachers selectively use scriptures they like to prove their false doctrines and ignore the ones that show them in error. It's amazing how James in the context of faith and works is completely ignored by those who promote O-S-A-S, which is true. They, they don't really necessarily like the, the book of James. And other men-pleasing doctrines that teach, all you have to do is live out your life the best way you can and you're guaranteed security in Christ. The Holy Spirit in James is saying that good works are a byproduct of faith. Faith is a continuous tenuous action verb that requires diligent effort of maintaining whether it be enduring trials temptation burdens etc it requires that we constantly walk in it 
not a one-time profession of it. Carnality and counterfeit Christianity are byproducts of false doctrines examples, the OSAS teaching. This doctrine encourages and justifies carnality and gives a false sense of security to those who are not truly sold out for Christ. And though we are not perfect and make mistakes, the salvation obtained through faith by personal relationship with Christ out of the heart of repentance will demonstrate its authenticity by its fruit, by its fruits or works. I repeat, this is not a saved by works salvation. We are not saved by good deeds or works, but the scripture does teach that true followers of Christ will have them. They are merely the proof of our commitment to Christ that we have obtained grace through faith. Counterfeit Christians can't produce them authentically. They can display a form of godliness that look a lot like them, but their essence and their fruit gives them away. They draw huge followings and are blind leaders of the blind. Their fruit, the fruit of their ways are the works of the flesh. They mock, speak evil of, and ridicule the true servants of Christ, hoping to add burdens amongst the brethren. Christ's love displayed on the cross paying a ransom for our sins and us obtaining salvation through a personal relationship with him does not negate our responsibility to maintain good works after salvation as instructed by Apostle Paul in Titus 3, 8 and 14. Important to note, Whenever there's an understanding or interpretation of scripture that's not consistent with other scriptures dealing with the same or similar subject matter, we must examine all of the scripture in light of other scripture to fully get what is going on with that issue, lest we make God a liar and make him contradict himself or by injecting our own meaning unto scripture to prove a preconceived doctrine thus explaining away biblical context, ignoring God's wisdom and instruction, and in building philosophical arguments based on a sum of parts and not a sum of the whole. I hear ministers and teachers all the time imply that those who reject the OSAS belief are basically believing that Jesus' death on the cross was not sufficient for our salvation. Yes, we hear them say that all the time. Can you believe that? That's just me putting my two cents in there. Can you believe that? That's what they say. Which ties back to this assumption of salvation by works. Belief that, though some teach it in conjunction with keeping the Old Testament law, it is not now, nor has it ever been my interpretation of Scripture I believe scripture teaches good works and fruit will follow salvation if we're obedient and steadfast. If we're not, we can be, we can be led astray and deceived enough through a hardened heart of unbelief and fall away like the scripture teaches. You're not saved by keeping the Old Testament law or by doing good deeds. You're also not saved because you went down an aisle when you were eight years old or repeated a vain, repetitious prayer with no change in lifestyle or evidence of godly fruit. And a lot of you just keep your you just keep that stuff you do and so secretive. You think nobody's seeing, but God sees. That's how little you have faith in God. You really think he doesn't see or you think he's just going to pat you on the head. It's, it's OK. You just do whatever you want. You hurt whoever you want. You know, God don't care. He don't care if you do th these evil, wicked things that the devil's people are doing, right? Let me read that again. You're not, you're also not saved because you went down an aisle when you were eight years old or repeated a vain repetitious prayer with no change in lifestyle or evidence of godly fruit. And to think that you're eternally secure and that you don't have to do anything to work out your own salvation in fear and trembling, as stated in Philippians 2, 12. God working in you to want to, thanking you will never fall away despite the fact that 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 warns 
of the coming falling away. 1 Timothy 4.1 also warns, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. It means what it says, not what we want it to. We need to endure and stay strong and encourage one another in the faith that we may have joy in rejoicing while bearing good fruit. But we must also warn with fear that we do not fall after the same example of those with unbelief, which happened to some through provocations, deceitfulness of riches, pride of life, doctrines of demons, lust of other things, becoming reprobate. We are encouraged to fight the good fight of faith. This is a continuous action that requires will and effort on our part to abide in faith and truth. We're also encouraged to endure to the end, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Matthew 24, 13. It's amazing how some of, of the same people that subscribe to OSAS doctrine believe we have a free will prior to salvation, but then believe God takes away our free will to turn away from him or believe no matter what we do. That's what these people believe, and they live that way. To year after year after year, some of these have done this, that know that, I was, that I've been under this persecution for years now, and they participated in it. They participate in it to this day. And they, and they really believe no matter what they do, they're safe, that Jesus is right there with them. Jesus just, just brought judgment down in this whole, this whole United States and tried to tell people, you know, I, to repent. And they, they won't do it. They're going to do whatever they want to do. And they're going to pay the consequences for it. That's the great falling away. Having no love or kindness or consideration. Just doing and hurting whoever you want. It doesn't matter. Because you're once saved, always saved. That's why I have a problem with that doctrine. Or believe no matter what we do, we could never fall short of our portion of the promise given to those who endure to the end. Scripture does not teach this. Note, I'll deal with the predestination doctrine in another post, which also ignores a lot of scripture and takes others out of context. The unlearned use this doctrine to defend the OSAS heresy also. To endure is something in something is like running a race through to the end without being distracted by obstacles in the way or yielding to fatigue and giving up. Scripture makes it very clear that a man has been given a free will to choose whether he, whether or not to serve God. Non-believers must make a choice to receive the fullness of God's grace and the free gift of salvation to be saved. Believers must choose to remain steadfast, abiding in God's grace, having received the free gift of salvation and not going back under the law to fall from grace. Galatians 5, 4. Other scriptures of the OSAS people try but can't explain away. Important note, the book of Hebrews, like all the New Testament scriptures, apply to all believers and all non-believers of today as well as its original audience. That's why it's a part of the inspired text. The New Testament never implies that certain passages are not meant for certain believers to not regard its blessings, warnings, redemptions, and punishments. Only man-made doctor, doctrine surmises this through historical and philosophical reasoning. The Bible is man's how-to manual of life. The only part that no longer apply in the letter of it is the Old Testament law and all its ordinances. Scriptures that often get ignored or explained away out of context by the OSAS People are found in Hebrews 3, 4, and 6, where the author, inspired of the Holy Spirit, gives an example of and warns against one's heart being hardened unto unbelief and not entering into God's rest. This was a warning to the brethren. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you, in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Hebrews 3, 12. God doesn't issue idle threats, nor does he issue idle warnings. 
through the mouth of his servants by the power of his spirit. If God is warning against something, it's because it can happen and most likely is happening. We either heed and obey the warning or turn away and rebel against it. Many of the OSAS people use Ephesians 1.13 as a defense for their teachings. But Hebrews 4 tells us to labor to enter into God's rest and not become hardened in our hearts unto unbelief, lest we should fall short of that promise left for us. Now, I just want to say that you can be once saved, always saved. And this is just a missy note. As long as you keep on enduring to the end, you know what? Love your brother and sister. You know what? If, if somebody comes to you and gives you a, a, a link and you have access to somebody's private life, you know what? That's being a busybody in other man's matters. You know, you know what? When you, t when you interfere between a husband and a wife like that, listening to what they are saying like that, and some of you, you've even listened to people in their bedrooms having sex, and you know you have. And then you get on there and you say that you're saved and born again and once saved, always saved and able to do it. And you know I'm telling the truth. You know that you've been listening to people and using their microphones to listen in on their private life in the bathroom and having sex with their spouse or maybe having sex with somebody else for that matter. But either way, you're sitting there being a busybody and, and breaking the laws of this land and breaking the laws of God to find out and gossip about it. And, and what's that make you? That makes you twice as ready to go to hell as any of the rest of us, is what I think. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise of being left, left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. You know, before all this, I would have, I, I would have said to you, I really wasn't sure. But after all these years of having to go through this torment in hell with people who call themselves Christians and use the name of Jesus, I'm convinced now that this is the proper right way because anybody who could sit and convince themselves to do that to another human being and them having kids of their own, knowing that my kids' lives are being put out there and, and putting our lives in danger like that. And you're taking part in that. And then you say you're once saved, always saved. That's what, the more that that's gone on, the more that I know that the, I don't want anything to do with, with that anymore because if that's what it's about and it's just your license to sin I don't want to do it I don't want to have anything to do with that because I know that I'm not the only one you're doing it to you're hurting a lot of people and you're and you're using and you're using a false doctrine like that or even I don't know you're using that doctrine is let's just put it that way you're using that doctrine to do whatever you want to whomever you want. And that makes you a complete idiot if you would do something like that to your brothers and sisters and not have an ounce of fear of God. Just absolutely idiotic to do something like that, to harm your brothers and sisters. I, I just can't believe you'd ever even consider doing it. The body is sealed, but we have to abide and be steadfast and labor to remain part of the body through obedience lest we fall away and forfeit our portion in the promise given to the body. Another argument is that if you turn away from, the belief, from believing in Jesus and his word, you were never truly saved in the first place. Well, I've happened to see some of these people who were truly saved and truly touched by God. I mean, they really served God. They really, they, they wanted to... They started living their whole lives around God. And then they started going back to drinking or something, whatever else. And then they ended up dead. I seen one man, he just ended up dead and, and, and he, he died drunk. He believed it in this once saved, always saved. And, and he died drunk in a, in a vehicle accident. The problem with this logic is that like explained earlier, ignores all scriptures where he's talk, talking to the brethren, warning them about falling away. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So, 
If you're living in sin like that and you just absolutely refuse to stop drinking, to stop spying on your neighbor and then making critiques and judgment and all the things you do whenever you, why do you spy on people in the first place? What, what makes you think you really have the right? If you're living in those things, then you're living away from Christ. And there really is no sacrifice anymore. How could there be any sacrifice for those sins if you're still actively living in them? That doesn't make sense to me. You're not made a partaker of the Holy Ghost if you're not an authentic believer. Brethren, in, this, in Scripture denotes community of believers in faith, followers or disciples of Christ, Christian or saint, etc. To that extent, it does not denote non-believer or non-Christian. Rightly dividing God's word is essential for sound teaching and sound living, and that is why it is necessary to reprove the OSAS fallacy as well as other heresies that affect how we live as Christians, how we define grace, and how we interpret God's words for the maintaining of good works and fruit, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Titus 3, 8. Now, Charlie, I tell you, I've never seen anybody more humble than him. And uh, he died so young. But God had told him that he was going to bring him home. He did pray to be healed. His mom prayed to be healed. And both of them was told no. And, and they accepted that, that that's what Jesus wanted. But now Charlie had a near-death experience. And where he said that the Lord was calling him Charlie's son. Charlie's son. And uh, he, he, like myself, got to see hell. And we both had an experience that is extraordinary with Jesus, just like Howard Pittman. And we, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't ask you to believe it. I just know that it happened. I gave my testimony. I told you exactly what happened. I was being electrocuted. I had a hit put out of my life. And Jesus was standing there beside me. And, and instead of being angry at those, some of those, he said, were his. He had nothing but love for them. He is a very love. He's very loving. But he, I tell you what. He. What Charlie and I, what we're all telling you, what. Howard Pittman is telling you, there's another side. And it's also like Isaiah said, when you get up there, you become undone. And it's not a game. And everything we do is waiting for us just as soon as we get over there. And that, that's, that's just the truth. I'm going to start back at Jude 1.6. Even tells us this. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but kept their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness and to the judgment of the great day, now, if the angels who God created as ministering spirits have a free will to walk away and leave their first estate because of Satan's deception, so too can we turn and walk away if we don't heed the warnings and be steadfast in the faith. We must always be steadfast. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as ye know, for as ye know, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. 2 Peter 3.17 Saints, be confident in the fact that God can keep you if you're willing to be kept. If you're willing to be kept. He's long-suffering and is not willing that any should perish. That being true, he also doesn't take away our ability to choose to live for or rebel against him. No man can pluck us out of his hand. But we do have a free will to walk away from it. Being careful to maintain good works is not salvation by works. We are saved by grace through faith and not of works. Scripture also says faith without works is dead. Your works are the fruit of you produce after salvation based on your faith identifying you as an authentic believer and follower of Christ. 
Remember the warning. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. God never warns in vain. And if those whom he is warning are not saved or authentic, what is he warning against departing from? And who are these people that can partake in the Holy Spirit without being saved? This warning is for saints. And this is why we are told to be ye steadfast. Accumulation of scripture is clear on this. Philosophical and emotional interpolation of scriptures does not supersede the wisdom and truth of biblical text. The purpose of this reproof is not meant for dispute or contention, but for correction. And for me, I'm just reading it because I'm sick and tired of these people who say they love Jesus and they're always saved, once saved and forever saved, and they're able to do just whatever they want. That's why I'm reading this. You all need to back off. You're not just free, given to do whatever you want, you know, without consequences. We are instructed to preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. Second Timothy 4, 2-3. Let us endure and grow sound in the faith. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God of the doctrine of baptisms and laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. It's time for meat, saints, for ye for when ye for when for the time ye ought to be teachers ye have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of god and are become as such as have need of milk and not of strong meat for every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness for he is a babe but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age even those who by reason of use of their senses exercised to discern both good and evil if any man hath an ear let him hear and these are the comments that called put called 20 called servant people continue to explain away scripture's warnings of remaining steadfast for the faith for the doctrine of false security the security of the believer belongs to those who endure to the unto the end and remain in christ and who don't fall away into unbelief like scripture warns will happen in those last times and the scripture is clear on that and some of you are dear brethren and i love you and how god is using your ministries for the sake of the gospel but you're ignoring or explaining away too many scriptures to hold to the osas doctrine this doctrine mainly hurts those who believe No matter what they do, they're secure. He's right. Yes, people backslide and commit sin, and God forgives and shows mercy and will continue to keep those who are willing to be kept in repentance. God's grace delivers, not in rebellion. If a brethren turns from the faith unto apostasy, they have fallen away. And many are falling away, so it is happening. And you can't fall away from what you never were a part of. Again, most of the arguments defending this doctrine are philosophical and not biblical. No, just a reiteration for those who are being subverted by dangerous and unbiblical teachings on this subject. It says, uh, last note, this was on August 8, 2014, 746 a.m., I find most people hold this doctrine because someone other than the Holy Spirit, exactly, that's what I say, because someone other than the Holy Spirit taught them this doctrine and how to interpolate Scripture to arrive at this doctrine. Reading Scripture under the guidance and understanding of the Holy Spirit does not bring you to his to this doctrine. Man does. Also, 
What I want to add to the last note, the rejection of this man-made doctrine is not about arguing whether or not Jesus finished the work on the cross. True saints already know he finished the work, became the perfect sacrifice for sin on the cross. The point is, is does Jesus tell us to continue to abide, remain in him after he's received us? The answer is yes. As well, the apostles warn us not to be led astray by the error of the wicked. Adherence to this doctrine is one of the main reasons carnal Christians never come to the full knowledge of the truth in their words or deeds. They stumble at scriptures tossed to and fro with every kind of bad teaching that sounds good with no desire to live holy, no desire to live holy, no desire to live holy but rather to live with a false sense of security, with no fruits of spiritual development. Just because 100,000 say, follow, or believe something, that, that does not make it true. Jesus only used 12 to spread what 100,000 liars and deceivers couldn't. And it says down here about him, called, called I'm a born-again Christian who believes Jesus Christ died and rose again to pay the penalty for my sins and sent the spirit of truth to teach me all things. Amen. I'm not trying to just be somebody who's just trying to browbeat you. But you guys, you guys put my family in danger. You've caused me so much grief. That if, that if God were to put it on a scale and weigh it, and you were able to feel what you have done, using his name to do it, you can't calculate the kind of pain that it has caused. And I'm talking to the ones who I believe are really pr probably saved. How could you ever take part in this? How could you ever take part in, the, in these last days' persecution of the saints? These saints that they are going and, and doxing them. Did you ever think that it could happen to you? How would you like it if you were in your bed with your spouse and you were having intimate relationships or you were in the bathroom and, or, your, or your spouse, your wife, or your precious daughter was exposed and, and you were somebody you lo loved. People who said that they loved Jesus and loved you were a part of it. Do you see why I'm saying I don't believe once saved, always saved before? I, I just put it to the back burner and just just thought well I don't know what to make of it but I see that you have no fear of God you have no love for for people to do something like that Jesus hasn't changed your heart at all or you could never do that I could understand you falling into it once or twice but this has been a continuous habitual year after year thing for some of you this isn't a one-time thing. And that's why I've tried, I've tried to warn. I tried to warn when I seen the boat sinking, Trump's boat sinking. And I said, this, this, is, this is the judgment right here. And I put that on my Facebook. And I knew that I would get hated for it. And that's when I put up Warning to America by Keith Daniel. I was under the anointing and leading of the Holy Spirit when I did that. And Jonah kept having the dreams about Jonah. To, to just speak out about this. You have to repent. You have to stop doing this. You're going to you're going to be held accountable for it. It's not what you think. That you could just go on and sin and do these things. It's different than that. There's consequences for what you are doing. All kinds of them. It's wrong. By the grace of God, I love you and forgive you. But it's not because I have that strength inside myself. I'd be a liar if I told you that. But it's by His grace that I can. By His powerful anointing on the Holy Spirit. But forgiveness isn't a past that says, You know what? I forgive you. Go ahead and do to me whatever you want. Listen to my conversations. Know that yourself in my business. It doesn't mean that. What it does mean is that for the sake of my salvation, my soul, my sanity, and for most of all, because God's grace calls me to be obedient, 
I obediently forgive you. Bless you all in Jesus' name.